Okay, so let's get started here with this program. Um, okay, so patient selection for the EOTTS procedure, and like with many other disease processes, and that's what we're talking about is the disease of the tilotarsal joint. And we're gonna classify patients as ideal, less than ideal, high risk, and then not a candidate. So just because somebody is a high risk, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a contraindication. It just means that this patient is gonna be at a higher likelihood of um, having to have the stent potentially removed. Um, and then as we have our ideal patients, and these are the patients that we should have great expectations for. So how do we, do, how do we determine if a, is a patient a candidate for the EOTTS procedure? Um, and really it kind of, it doesn't really make a difference what kind of device you use. Um, but so anyway, we have, um, uh, this is gonna be based on both clinical and radiographic observations and measurements. And so let's jump right into this. So when the patient's on the exam room table, you're gonna put their tilotarsal joint through a range of motion. And, and I have another lecture that hopefully some of you have already heard. It's called First Cause Orthopedics. And whenever you perform a lower extremity foot and ankle exam, one of the first things that you should evaluate, and, and this doesn't matter, I mean, if, they, if they're in for a suspected neuroma or plantar fasciitis for a hallux valgus correction um, uh, deformity, you always need to start with the evaluation of the subtalar joint because that is the first cause that leads to so many of these other secondary conditions. So, and the other thing that I want to really point out too, with ex especially with this examination here, is that I am not just inverting and everting the heel. If you only invert and evert the heel, that's only checking one of the four joints of the tilotarsal joint. So that's the posterior talocalcaneal facet. When we load the lateral column of the foot, that's going to show us how much pronation is occurring or how much of, of the pro uh, tilotarsal joint pronation is occurring. So this patient here tells, what we see is that there's just too much. So that's pretty obvious. So what are the other things that we're gonna look at? Well, we wanna determine the reducibility and the flexibility of the talotarsal joint. If the patient has a rigid or semi-rigid talotarsal joint, then that can also complicate the long-term results of the EOTTS procedure post-operatively. One of the first, the second thing that we want to do besides the reducibility and flexibility is we would have to rule out if the patient has a tarsal coalition. The last thing that we want to ever um, have you experience or a patient experience is that they have, uh, you've taken them to the operating room only to discover then that they have a tarsal coalition. So the way that we're going to help rule that out is by comparing um, the dynamic rate weight bearing radiographs of relaxed stance position and corrected or neutral stance alignment afterward. Then we're gonna go over some key radiographic angles to um, help determine that grading system. Of course, we wanna identify those co-pathologies. The foot has 26 bones, 33 joints, and over 100 muscles, ligaments, and tendons. So when, with the EOTTS procedure, we're realigning the talus on the calcaneus. There could be other co-deformities that we also have to address either conservatively or surgically. So just we need to be cognizant of that. Now, when a patient presents with symptoms and only with unilateral symptoms in one foot, that doesn't mean that you should ignore the contralateral limb because if you only treat the symptomatic foot and, and don't treat the unsymptomatic foot, that unsymptomatic broken foot then can um, lead to complications of the EOTTS procedure. So what I'm trying to say there is that when we look at when patients have had to have hypercure removed and then we evaluate how many of those patients had hypercure performed in both feet or a unilateral, it's they're gonna have a higher chance of removal if it was a unilateral foot correction. So that's kind of like putting new tires on one side of the car and leaving the old worn out tires on the other side. Of course, the new tires are gonna wear out very quickly. So when we talk about the grading system, just like most other disease processes, we're gonna have um, four grades. And so we have mild, moderate, and severe. And the severe ones are don't even think about it. And then the other ones are still a potential, but we're gonna classify them as far as what is the potential that, they're, that the hypercure stand is not gonna work out that great. So with these, these kind of observations and the problem with an observation is that it does not really give us a number. 
Well, we can see with this adult foot, they're going from relaxed stance position into neutral stance position, is that it's not normal. We have um, a medial bulging of the tailor head and the forefoot turns into a valgus. So we definitely know that there is something going on here. Um, and, but I would classify this as a mild. Now we see that the patient is holding up his hallux on the right foot. He doesn't have a pathology there. He's just having to fire the extensor hallucis longus in order to um, resupinate his hind foot. So you kind of just ignore that. So again, here's another patient, and this is just, this is a mild deformity, this, but it's still a pathology. This is still broken. This excessive motion is going to lead to tissue strain, and, potential, and eventually this patient's gonna end up with some kind of pathologic process. Uh, even though they're mild, you think that, well, they don't, they're really not even a candidate for the EOTTS procedure. Well, that's not correct. That's like saying that, well, let's wait till somebody has severe hypertension in order to start treating them. People with mild forms of hypertension start getting treatment right away. So it's the same thing here um, with these feet. Um, obviously, again, it's up to the patient. We're not saying that anybody with just a slight misalignment should end up with um, hind foot correction, um, but it's something that is, it's the patient's choice. Now, we looked at the front of the foot, and then we have the patient turn around so that we can look at their hind foot. And something that, this is pretty rare, but again, I'm, I'm here to point out some of the, the not so common findings so that you're aware of them, is that this patient actually has a um, recurrent teletarsal joint displacement. You can see the too many toe sign, the medial tailor head bulging, but she also has a slight calcaneal varus. So if you're considering this patient for um, a hypercure insertion, you have to make sure that you don't overcorrect the talotarsal joint and put the patient into a calcaneal varus um, issue. So here's another patient who, again, you can see their hind foot is placed into neutral position and then they go into the relaxed stance position. Now, one of the things that I would always tell my patient is besides, do you feel the difference in your feet? But I want them to be a, pay attention to what's occurring in their knees, hips, and back. And a lot of times then they'll feel like, yeah, I can feel my knees twisting. I can feel the hip as it's rotating out of my pelvis. I can feel like I'm just slouching more. And um, so those are all a lot of different things that we need to take a look into. Um, so we have a question here. So let me actually just, I guess, jump into this right now, is um, that the parents are concerned about their children's flat feet, but the child has no complaints do we still recommend performing hypercure despite no symptoms? And is that within the standard of care? Well, so what is the standard of care? The standard of care is saying, okay, we have is to first diagnosing a deformity. So a pediatric patient with flat feet, they have a osseous pathologic deformity that there is absolutely no radiographic evidence that this child with those misaligned feet with the tailless partially dislocated on the calcaneus, that it's gonna magically uh, realign back on the calcaneus. So what's gonna happen with that child is with every step that they take, they're gonna have strain to the spring ligament. And so eventually the spring ligament is gonna become destroyed. And then uh, we have excessive force acting on the plantar fascia, the posterior tibial tendon, and then the pathology that's gonna be associated with the first metatarsal. Um, the next webinar that, that I'm giving is on pediatric flat feet, and the title of it is that it's a disaster waiting to happen because those kids with flat feet are going to have um, osseous pathology, tissue pathology that's going to happen not only with their foot and ankle, but within their knees, hips, or back. So what is the standard of care? The standard of care is to say, this is your problem, and here are the various treatment options. You can do nothing. You can observe this condition. Meanwhile, with every step that the patient takes, they're going to have more and more tissue strain. We can give you a shoe insert, but there's absolutely no radiographic evidence that, that, that even the best custom old orthotic is preventing the abnormal dislocation of the talus on the calcaneus. So, or we can perform um, traditional rear foot reconstructive surgery, but the problem with that is that there's many complications, long recovery, and so we really don't wanna have to perform that nuclear option um, until we really have to. Or we have the last treatment, which is the insertion of a sinus tarsi stent into the sinus tarsi space. And this is going to instantly provide us with the correction that we need. We're gonna see physical, 
um, correction of the deformity as well as radiographic normalization of the pathologic angles preoperatively. At that point, it's up to the parent to decide if uh, they want to proceed uh, with that treatment option with their patient. This is not life and death situation. We're not going to convince somebody to have surgery. We're just giving them the options. Of course, part of the informed consent is to tell the parent that these stents are not 100% um, perfect. There's, a, there's um, individuals who could develop pain or soreness after the insertion of the stent. But one of the great things about these devices is that we can reverse it. We can make a small incision and remove it. So what are the benefits of putting in a hypercure stent into this patient's foot is that we normalize the foundation joint to the body. We decrease the strain to very important tissues within the foot and ankle. Plus we have the positive effects to the knees, hips and back. So it seems like there's a tremendous amount of benefit. What is the potential risk? Patient develops pain and they have to have the stent removed. And at that point, they can then go on to other options. So um, it should basically is uh, below the standard of care to not provide that kind of information to a patient just to, just to blow them off like most of the pediatric papers say with the pediatricians of the, the number one goal of treating a pediatric flat foot is to convince the parents that no treatment is necessary. And then look at all of the, the articles posted later on that show um, all of these um, complications that happen because of those misaligned feet. We're gonna talk about that later on. So let's keep going back to our patient selection right now. Okay, so this is that moderate one. And again, moderate. So why this is a little bit more than that mild, um, that patient, they still have an intact posterior tib tendon. They probably have some uh, definite changes that are gonna be seen on an MRI of their posterior tib tendon. Uh, plantar fascia is gonna definitely be in, uh, affected as well. So we have a little more tissue pathology with that patient. Um, I wanna go back here to, this is something that's kind of neat. Uh, whoops. Where, here we go, is to look at the hallux of this patient. So see how when they're into the neutral stance position, the hallux is on the left side of the arrow and then how the hallux extends beyond that. So why do we get an over lengthening of the medial column of foot bones? It happens all the way back here because of the anterior deviation of the, um, the talus. It, it pushes that cymaline line anteriorly. That's what causes all of this tissue strain. And going back to that pediatric patient, um, you know, again, this, this patient, she just didn't wake up with this condition this morning. It was there since birth. So now we're getting into a little bit more of that, the kind of the end stage of the moderate. This foot's really collapsing. Um, probably there is some hypermobility of the first metatarsal bone, and we always need to evaluate the first ray of patients. Um, and, and let me iter reiterate too something is that when we're looking at this patient selection for the EOTTS procedure, I'm primarily focusing on the reducibility or non-reducibility of the tilotarsal joint. And something that I probably shouldn't do is that I'm going to assume that you, you have to evaluate the entire foot structure. So I'll say that over and over again. So you have to address these other conditions. So this is a patient that probably is gonna be a good candidate for tilotarsal stabilization, but then they're gonna to need to be followed up with a custom molded orthotic to help um, realigning their first metatarsal bone. Okay, so now this is a patient that is definitely a severe flat foot. This patient could still be a candidate for the insertion of a sinus tarsi implant, but you cannot perform this as a standalone. If you do, it's doomed to fail because we have multiple broken parts of this patient's foot. The plantar fascia is probably stretched out, posterior tib is definitely stretched out, and we have first ray disease. And again, this is happening in both feet. So going back to that pediatric patient, if we would have treated them when they were much younger, still a, a ped, still an adolescent, probably all we would need to do is pop in a hypercure stent. Now that we've let this delay all of these de many decades later, now we have multiple broken components. So instead of just putting in a hypercure implant, now we're gonna have to go in and do a posterior tip augmentation and probably a cotton or a lapidus, a plantar factory lapidus procedure to stabilize the medial column of the foot. And then again, here we go, here's this patient. They now have a fixed rigid deformity and maybe now they have symptoms in their feet after all of these years, but what is your option? 
you can't do anything, any more observation. It's just going to continue to get worse. Are you going to try to give this patient an orthotic or um, maybe an AFO or something like that? It's ridiculous. It's not going to help them. They're not going to wear it. It's bulky. So it's kind of a shame because now here this patient has had knee replacement surgery, uh, chronic hip pain, and has had back surgery, and nobody ever uh, took a look at her foot to say, yeah, maybe we need to realign those feet. Here's another guy. He wasn't always like this. He used to also have those pediatric flat feet, and now that he's in his late 70s, his feet are just really destroying his body. He has very limited mobility. His quality of life is horrible. And now it's too late to perform any kind of a simple procedure like the um, extraosseous teletarsal stabilization. So this is what we don't want to wait for patients to end up like this to initiate a treatment. Obviously, we can't do anything uh, as far as those hypercures with this. So this is the last thing that we want to see. Um, I, I, I don't want to see an x-ray sent to me of, of a patient that had a hypercure put into this foot. It's not giving them any correction. We can't just jam it into the sinus tarsi and think we did a great job. This patient was never a candidate for um, an EOTTS procedure. So what I'm gonna do now is I wanna bring in another polling question. Like in here it comes. And I wanna ask you, uh, do you think that this patient is a candidate for the um, hypercure procedure. So let me play this video again. So, you know, this is not a child, this is not an elderly adult, and looks like there's some good flexibility. So go ahead and tell me if, just with this x-ray, or with this video here, that you can um, confidently tell this patient. So let's say that, because you guys are gonna become master surgeons of putting in hypercure, you will have patients contacting you from all around the world to have this procedure uh, performed. And so if they sent you this video, what is your answer? Okay, so let's end our polling. I think we have just about everybody in there. And I'm going to share the results. And it's kind of a little bit shocking, <laughs> not really. But so 40, uh, 31% of you said yes, one said no. Um, and then 62% said we need more information. And it's really the last question, the last answer is the, um, is the answer. They need more information. This shows us only one thing, that we have a flexible hind foot, but that does not tell us the quality of the, um, the bones. It doesn't show us what's going on between the talus and the calcaneus. So we have to have x-rays in order to determine if a patient is a candidate or not. Now, with this x-ray alone, this tells us that we have a sagittal plane deformity. Yes, we can see that there's an anteriorly broken sima line and some other things going on, kind of a lower than normal calcaneal inclination angle. But we need more information. Here again, we can see that there's an obliterated sinus tarsi, um, anteriorly deviated sima line. So even from this one, would you think that this is actually a candidate for a hypercure insertion? Um, so... I don't know, we're gonna find out. And I always love this one. I'm gonna show this x-ray pretty much on every webinar I ever do. If you had this weight-bearing x-ray, what are your treatment options for this patient? Um, they're pretty limited. So that's why we have to determine, yes, we have a partial dislocation of the talus on the calcaneus, but this x-ray shows me the end pathology. It doesn't show me if it's flexible or not. So if you ever are thinking about um, offering the EOTTS solution, for a patient, please do your patient, yourself, and me a favor by getting two sets of x-rays. The first one is what you normally get with a relaxed stance position. The second one is with the corrected stance, with their foot placed back into neutral alignment. Now, with those x-rays, they're going to show us so much information, but even more importantly, is what it's going to show your patient. Because your number one job at this point is diagnosing. You want to gather the information to see what is going to be the best treatment option for your patient, for whatever their complaining symptoms are. So we can take a look at a lot of different things here that shows us that this patient absolutely has a flexible deformity. The talus can be put back on the calcaneus. We see what happens when the talus has shifted off of the calcaneus and we have our sagittal plane deformity, navicular drop, and then we can also see that frontal plane deformity because the sus and tachyon telli 
that should be dorsally angulated has fallen and now it's plantarly angulated. So it's, it's kind of amazing where a lot of people out there, a lot of physicians think that it's the spring ligament failure that leads to the partial dislocation of the talus. That's wrong. Other people say that it's posterior tibia insufficiency that leads to subtalar joint instability or RTTJD, the recurrent teletarsal joint dislocation. Again, that's wrong. What happens is that the articular facet between the talus and the calcaneus, the posterior talocalcaneal joint, is where the true pathology happens. That's where the talus slides forward, and that's where we get all the rest of the pathologies um, that we normally see on these x-rays. So the number one thing, and this is very important for your patients, and this is what you're going to explain to them, is that on the resting, how you normally stand on the resting stance position, we see how your ankle bone is not where it's supposed to be into alignment but they don't know where it's supposed to be. So now that we look at the bottom x-ray, we can see the reopening of the sinus tarsi and how the, the joints are back into normal alignment. And then you wanna show them their arch bone. This is the navicular. So you say the reason why your arch is lower than normal is because your arch bone has fallen and that's directly, um, that's, that happens because of the talus, the ankle bone is falling out of position. And then, you know, the, you're probably not going to show them the sussitaculum tali, but then the other angle is the tiller declination angle, how it goes from a more vertical to a more horizontal when the talus is placed back on the calcaneus. Why is the tiller declination angle important? Well, you have to think about the excessive forces that are acting on the distal end of the calcaneus instead of those forces passing through the navicular into the rest of the foot bones. So when we take a look at this x-ray here, this is a mess. And you know, for some people, you just don't know, is this patient gonna be a candidate for the insertion of an implant or not? So what I really recommend, I mean, if you really wanna become an expert in performing this procedure, is to get weight-bearing fluoroscopy. Because now what we can do is have the patient stand, put their foot into neutral position, and then have them go into relaxed stance position. And this is gonna really show us the alignment of the talus on the calcaneus and the presenting deformities. Obviously, this patient here is not a candidate. This is a rigid end stage deformity. Believe me, their talus didn't always look like this, but now after hundreds of millions of steps and you know, several decades of walking, this is what they ended up with, with as a result of the Davis and Wolf's laws. So we go back to this question here of, is your patient a candidate for the EOTTS procedure? When I take a look at this, we see a, a, a Taylor declination angle that's abnormal, obliterated sinus tarsi, the, the navicular is kind of dropped down. It, so if I ask you the question, is this patient a candidate or not? You're gonna say, I don't know, because I wanna get the relaxed, uh, the, the neutral stance. So here's your neutral stance x-ray. So is this patient a candidate for EOTTS or not? And the answer is not, because we have still the same obliteration of the sinus tarsi. We do not have an opening of that space whatsoever. So we do have elevation of the navicular. Um, so what is actually occurring is instead of the motion happening at the subtalar joint, at the posterior facet, that motion is happening at the uh, telonavicular joint. So that's why with that previous video that I showed you that we had the polling question, is that a candidate or not? Well, that patient actually had a telecalcaneal coalition. So just looking at the video, yeah, I would have thought that sure, they look like they're a candidate, but in reality, they're not. Now, that doesn't mean that EOTTS is a contraindication in this patient. Um, what what kind of changes that is, are you able to remove the tarsal coalition? So this is very unlikely in this situation because it's, we'd have to see an MRI or CT scan. But if it's a calcaneal navicular coalition, well, most likely we can remove that and put a, 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 the stent into that patient's space. Going back to this patient. So if this patient uh, was sent to you and, um, what is, and, and you know, they're symptomatic, they have pain, not only in their feet, but their knees, hips, and back, what is your recommendation? 
just um, observation? Are you going to tell them to do some muscle strengthening because their posterior tib tendon is just weak and it need, they need to make it stronger? You're going to dispense them a pair of $800 custom molded orthotics, or are you just going to perform a subtalar arthrodesis in this patient? Because that's pretty much with this x-ray, that's the only options that I can see. Looking at this, there's absolutely no way that this patient is even a candidate for a sinus tarsi implant. Absolutely not. So I wouldn't even think about it, except that now I ordered that second x-ray and put their talus back on the calcaneus. And it, believe me, I mean, this is the same foot. Doesn't look like it at all, does it? Um, the, the articular facets are completely back where they're supposed to be. I mean, we see so many different things. Look at the elevation of the navicular. Look at the improved calcaneal inclination angle. I mean, so many things are going on here. So with this, Absolutely, this patient is a candidate for EOTTS. Why would I perform a subtalar arthrodesis procedure when I could put in this, this, um, this stent that could give me excellent results and still have range of motion? And again, look, thinking about those pediatric flat feet, forget about the symptoms in the feet. Think about the symptoms to the knees, hips, and back. Um, the reason why I show this is looking at the height of the talus compared to the plantar aspect of the calcaneus. And just look how that talus drops down. That's creating a functional leg length discrepancy, which is absolutely destroying the knees, hips, and back. Uh, it can also go up to affect the neck. So when you take a look at those corrected um, x-rays, completely ignore that forefoot because the patient's gonna have to really supinate their forefoot. <clears throat> in order to put the hind foot back into neutral alignment. So the only thing that I want to look at with this x-ray, excuse me, is the alignment of the talus on the calcaneus and the re recreation of the sinus tarsi space. So here's another patient. And how do we know if this is going to be a good candidate or a bad candidate for a hypercure stent? So, um, we see a lot of different things going on. We have a transverse plane deformity. We have anteriorly deviated cyma. We have a tailor head uncovering. This is never going to go away. This is only going to get worse. Again, is an orthotic going to help this person? It looks like that the lateral column is shorter than the medial column. Um, yeah, that's because of how far the talus is pushing forward. So that's, that's why the lateral column appears to be shorter. But anyways, let's, we're not talking about lateral column lengthenings. Um, and they have a little bit of an IM angle issue. So with all those different pathologies, of course, we're going to get our corrected stance position. So they have a Taylor second metatarsal angle that went from 36.3 degrees down to 8.1, um, which is really good. So from this, would you think that this patient is a good candidate for the EOTTS procedure? Because we definitely have reduction. I mean, the Taylor head is back into alignment with the navicular. Um, the the cyma line is decreased. And I mean, look what even happens at the first metatarsal with the, the, um, the sesmoids. I mean, we have a reduction of the intermetatarsal angle because the talus is put back into its neutral position. So from this x-ray, can you tell if this is a candidate for hypercure or not? I should make this another polling question, but because of time, I'm not. Um, so this is the relaxed stance and neutral stance. But we have to compare this to the lateral. You cannot judge, make a judgment on just a single plane. And so this was kind of a fooled you thing. This was that same patient that had the tarsal coalition. And yeah, we have to make sure that we can remove that coalition in order to put a, a, a stent into the sinus tarsi. So looking over here, we see that, you know, definitely obliteration of the sinus tarsi. But whenever you see the, the um, exostosis on the head of the talus, then that needs to tip you off that there's probably going to be a coalition. So if you took those two sets of x-rays, you would definitely see that. A lot of times the talus can just look funny. It just, just looks kind of weird. But remember about the halo sign. And so that should be a clue that, hmm, I got to make sure that there's not a coalition. So you don't need to send every single one of these patients off for a CT or MRI because that's just expensive. And if we, you know, again, we need to get, do our due diligence and make sure that we're accurately diagnosing our patients. But if you would have just performed the relaxed stance and the neutral stance x-rays, 
then that could help to rule out a tarsal coalition. If there's a question, then you can always send a patient to get that CT or MRI. So again, this is our, our Taylor Beaking. Let me go back here. And this patient has a calcaneal navicular coalition. So if we resect that coalition and we still have a nice um, chamber of the sinus tarsi, then we can put a sinus tarsi implant in there. So just to keep in mind about when do we see the coalitions? Well, a telonavicular one forms between three to five years of age. The calcaneal navicular is eight to 12 and a telocalcaneal is 12 to six. The reason why I put this out there is because um, I know of two situations where a patient developed a coalition after the insertion of a sinus tarsi implant. One patient was eight years old, another patient was 10 years old. And so the question was, did the hypercure implant lead to the tarsal coalition? And the answer is absolutely not. That coalition would have happened regardless of if, if, if the implant was put in or not. And so, the, um, so yeah, so there's just no way that this is gonna lead to a coalition. So what happens after you take out that calcaneal navicular coalition is that a lot of times the patient's foot's gonna flatten out even more because that coalition was trying to help stabilize the hind foot. So we've now gotten rid of that. So that's why putting in a sinus tarsi implant just makes total sense after resection of that coalition. So once you've gone, gone through, and the number one thing, I spent a lot of time on that, probably way too much, but as, I just wanna make sure that we've ruled out that tarsal coalition. So let's get in and start looking at some of the different radiographs. Don't be scared by this, ex, this picture here because I'm not gonna be talking about all of the different radiographic measurements that are known to man. Um, you need to look at the entire foot structure. I'm gonna keep saying that over and over again. But what I wanna get, um, what I'm focusing on is, can, is this patient a candidate for a sinus tarsi implant or not? Now, all these radiographic measurements and observations are based on the corrected, or sorry, the relaxed stance x-ray, not the corrected one, because we're looking at the deformity. And if they're in neutral stance, then that's not gonna show us that. The primary x-ray, there's really two that we're concerned about is the teller declination on the lateral and the teller second metatarsal on the DP view. But we also need to take into consideration the calcaneal inclination angle, as well as teller first metatarsal angle um, and what's going on in the midfoot. So we see that we have a sagittal plane deformity. That's super. We see that there's a, a lower than normal calcaneal inclination angle, but still I don't know, is this gonna be an ideal, less than ideal, or a high risk patient to put a sinus tarsi implant? So why I'm going through all of this is for patient expectations and for your expectations so that you can uh, provide the patient with um, proper consent to say you are a, a high risk of a greater than 50% chance that this device is not gonna work for you. Or yeah, you're, you're a great candidate to, great candidate for the hypercure stent. So we anticipate that you should have a less than 10% uh, chance of have, ever having to have it removed. So that's our goal. So how do we, how do we find out um, that kind of data? Well, this is based off of a, um, the, my study, the five-year retrospective study that was performed on adults. So this is not pediatrics, it's adults. Um, pediatric patients are probably gonna do even better than the adults because their bones are more flexible and still growing versus the adults that are gonna be a little um, le more deformed. So, what I found, and what actually what my team found, because I didn't measure any of these x-rays, was that the average Taylor declination angle in the sagittal plane was seven degrees. The maximum correction was 19. And so what does that mean to you? Well, please measure the Taylor declination angle on your patient's um, x-rays. And if it's greater than 42 degrees, that means that we're not gonna be able to bring the Taylor declination angle back to its absolute normal position. Now, does that mean that this is a contraindication if they have it greater than 42? Absolutely not. You just need to realize that we're not gonna make those angles, perf um, bring them back to perfect. So taking a look at kind of making this a mild, moderate, and severe, if they're a grade one is a Taylor declination angle of 22 to 27, a moderate's 28 to 33, and a severe is greater than 33. 
So again, I want to try to tighten these so that we can have the best possible outcomes for our patients. So if somebody has this mild sagittal plane deformity, then um, we're going to get great results. If it's a grade two, we're still going to get really, we're going to have good results. So there, because it's more of a deformity, there's going to be a higher likelihood of a long-term um, need to take out the, the implant. And then we have our not so good because with a tiller declination angle this large, it's possible that the, well, it's not possible, but most likely the patient's going to have many other co-deformities that could compromise the long-term success of hypercure. The reason why I talk about the calcaneal inclination angle is because um, it's something that we usually don't talk about. And it's, it's very important because we could put a hypercure stent into the patient's foot, but if they have a lower than normal calcaneal inclination angle, we don't achieve our primary goal of, of um, redistributing the excessive forces that were acting anteriorly back onto the posterior aspect of the foot. So we can see on the image to the left that this patient has a even higher than normal calcaneal inclination angle. The hypercure stent is in place. And so the, the subtalar joint forces are balanced and everything is super. But then on the x-ray on the right, we have a lower than normal calcaneal inclination angle. So what that means is we still have an excessive amount of force acting on the mid-tarsal joint. And so that could compromise the long-term success of the sinus tarsi implant. So with the, somebody that has a lower than normal calcaneal inclination angle, it's possible that we're going to need to do a TAL or gastroc recession. Maybe we even need to do a calcaneal osteotomy to, planner, to kind of increase the calcaneal inclination angle and then definitely do some mid-tarsal um, surgery so that we can um, repair the medial column of foot bones. Going back to that pediatric patient here, you can see what happens to the calcaneal inclination angle when the talus is not where it's supposed to be. And just fast forward to that patient 20, 30, 40 years, and we're gonna have significantly worse pathology, and the patient's gonna need to have significant hind foot reconstructive surgery. Versus now, when they're more flexible by realigning the talus on the calcaneus, we have an increase in the calcaneal inclination angle that's gonna take the forces off the rest of the foot. So that's a great thing. So let's take a look at the transverse plane. Now, one of the reasons why we use the Taylor second metatarsal and not the Taylor first metatarsal is because Taylor first metatarsal can give us a false negative. So if we measured this Taylor first metatarsal angle, it's within normal. So we say, sorry, you don't have a transverse plane deformity, so can't do anything for you. Well, that's incorrect. Now, the only reason that we should ever use the Taylor first metatarsal is if we're performing a cavus foot reconstructive procedure. So we see that this patient does not have a normally aligned first metatarsal bone. So that's why we want to use the second metatarsal bone. So once we do that, we can determine is this a normal or abnormal alignment. So a normal Taylor second metatarsal angle is anything where the, um, the angle is less than 16 degrees. The ideal is about eight degrees. But the easiest way to see if there's a transverse plane deformity is just looking at where is the bisection of the talus. So again, we can see the normal on the left and now the abnormal on the right. So anytime the bisection of the talus is medial to the first metatarsal bone, that tells us that we have a transverse plane deformity. Going back to the standard of care, is that custom made orthotic going to realign the talus? Is this going to prevent this hind foot osseous pathology? Absolutely not. That should be considered below the standard of care. So when we look at the transverse plane deformity with using Hypercure, I don't have any data on any other of the other devices, but the average correction is 19 degrees Maximum correction is 37. So if a patient has a Taylor second metatarsal angle greater than 53 degrees, we cannot expect it to be normalized. Just like for the Taylor declination angle, that doesn't mean, that does not mean, I wanna emphasize that, that it's a contraindication. It just means that we're not gonna be able to get it back into the normal position, the normal alignment. So this again shows our grade normal, zero, grade one, two, and three with our mild, moderate, and severe. So you can see those there. Um, so here we have, this is kind of like a, a mild, I'm sorry, a moderate 
And so with this one, we're, we're going to be able to, to um, reposition the talus on the calcaneus so that everything is nice and aligned. This, however, on the right is a much more severe angle. So we're going to, your expectations have to be lower because we are not going to be able to bring this back into its normal alignment. But you can see that, thank God, the patient's forefoot, they don't have a significant uh, metatarsus primus varus or anything else. It's, it's really like a, a pure sagittal plane deformity. But that's why too, something please do this for your patients, is don't just have laser focus on their feet when you're asking them about their symptoms. Ask them about their knees, hips, and back. I will guarantee you that this patient with this transverse plane deformity has definitely has definite pain in their knees, hips, and back. Most likely they're going to a chiropractor and on all kinds of medications to try to alleviate their pain and nobody can figure out why they have it and why they're not getting better. That's because nobody looks at their feet. So here's our grade one of mild and um, these patients should do great with just putting in a hypercure as a standalone procedure. They're going to be able to run, jog, and do whatever they want after that. Um, their plantar fascia is going to be intact. Posterior tib is, is going to be um, nice and healthy, and they should not have um, much of a first-rate deformity. But as time goes on, when we get a more moderate deformity, because what that means, and the reason why it's important to have these classifications, is that we have more tissue stress that's acting, that's on the spring ligament, on the posterior tib, um, plantar fascia in the first ray. So what are we gonna expect with somebody that has a moderate um, grade is that they're gonna have more tissue pathologies. Now, going back to that pediatric patient, their tissues are gonna be able to withstand those forces for a while. But once they become 40, 50, 60 years old, those tissues are gonna blow out. They just cannot handle that excessive strain that the tens of millions of steps taken um, over those several decades. So with these patients, you're gonna to have to probably bare minimum have some kind of um, custom-made orthotic in their shoes after you put in a hypercure. Um, maybe you can do it as a stage procedure where it's the combination of hypercure and a foot orthosis and then maybe the other secondary tissue pathologies will resolve or, you, or there's going to be other situations where you know that no, we're going to have to do more surgery on those patients feet. Same thing for the, the grade three with a severe. Um, we're going to expect to have um, a higher likelihood of secondary tissue pathology. So we need to look at that calcaneal inclination angle, spring ligaments gone, uh, posterior tib is gonna be blown out. So we have to be careful about that. Now, this is the very controversial um, section with the, the, these kind of rigid feet. So, I mean, these are obvious, I mean, these are just blown out feet. Don't even think about putting a hypercure in here. They have multiple deformities. They're, they're, you know, this is that end stage. But what you have to consider <clears throat> where some surgeons really push the limit, and I'm not recommending this because it's high risk, but it's the use of a sinus tarsi implant in a diabetic patient who looks like they're going to get into a Charco, or maybe they had a Charco in one foot and their other foot is kind of leaning that direction. So in that situation, what you could do is perform a TAL, and if their subtalar joint is flexible enough, you're gonna take your two sets of x-rays, that then you could put in a, a hypercure stent and potentially help to delay or prevent the, the other foot from going into a Charco. Because what do you always see in a Charco foot? It's that talus that's just jamming into the hind foot bones, and, and that's what those repeated forces is what leads to the, the um, explosion of the hind foot bones. So that's just something to think about. Now, those copathologies, very important to take a look at that because if you just put in a hypercure into this patient and we have amazing correction in their hind foot, and yes, their knees, hips, and back are doing so much better, but we have a huge broken part of their forefoot. This is compromised. And so if you put in a hypercure stent in somebody with such a severe increase in the IM angle, then you know, you're going to compromise the potential outcome of the hypercure stent. So now let's say that this patient develops pain in their sinus tarsi, they go to somebody who's not an advocate for this procedure, and they're gonna say, oh, those damn implants don't work. Well, yeah, they don't work if you don't put them in the right patient or if you don't identify and address copathologies. So that's why it's so important to look at the entire foot structure.
Now, one of the other lectures that we're going to be talking about in our webinar series is, is the effects of the positive effects of EOTTS on the first ray, where we are showing a reduction of the intermeditarsal angle just by putting in the hypercure stent. But this is beyond that. So this patient absolutely still has a, a, a four-foot valgus deformity that's going to really stress their subtalar joint and cause a lot of pain in the sinus tarsi area. So let's go through just a few more of um, just different cases to take a look at um, what, what, if they're a candidate or not. So again, we have a sagittal plane deformity. This is broken. This is an osseous pathology that will never get better. So in order to educate the parents and the patient and, and for yourself to roll out a coalition, you're going to order that second x-ray. Now, sometimes for whatever reason, maybe, you know, with some kids or maybe a bad radio, radiographic technician, um, one of the things that you could do if your x-rays are not looking like because and, and looking like the patient has a flexible deformity and you're really scratching your head because you've examined them weight bearing and non-weight bearing and you're like yeah i thought for sure that they had good subtalar joint range of motion maybe the x-rays are just not being taken um, correctly so the other way that you can check that is taking a non-weight bearing image just have the patient put their foot in the air and have the x-ray tech take the x-ray and you can see that there's now normalization of the talus on the calcaneus. So I'm gonna put that back. So we have the partial dislocation on the posterior facet that then sets off the chain reaction in the rest of the foot structures. Also then we can take a look at that calcaneal inclination and this is really kind of cheating, but you can just see that, that it's gonna be, it's lower slightly in um, the resting stance x-ray. So here we have our before and after. So this, on the x-ray on the left, this patient is in that kind of less than ideal of a candidate. They're still a, uh, definitely a candidate for the procedure because they're flexible, but um, we can see that there is significant reduction of this transverse plane deformity by performing a 10-minute soft tissue procedure. So um, is it absolutely perfect? It's not. I would love to see a little bit more correction. Am I happy with this? Yeah. I mean, within 10 minutes, we've definitely realigned their hind foot. Immediately, we have decreased the strain on the spring ligament, plantar fascia, posterior tib, and the first metatarsal. Look at the before and after of those tibial sesamoids. Look how we have a reduction of the intermetatarsal angle. Even you can see the frontal plane correction um, before and after this patient's foot. So why would, you know, for, you know, since we looked at that pediatric patient, why would we just ignore that and let this first ray become more and more deformed so that at some point, now instead of just putting in a hypercure, now we're gonna have to do multiple other procedures. So of course I have to throw in one of my ideal um, before and afters. These are great. This is absolutely right back to normal. And this patient's out running, jogging. They don't have to think about anything. They don't have to worry about um, having the inserts in their shoes life is great. But here's another situation where with an accessory navicular. So the patient comes in with pain over the, the medial um, aspect of the navicular bone. It's definitely enlarged. Now, this is kind of a debatable thing. I mean, it, so number one, the patient is a candidate. Let, let me just throw that off. I mean, they obviously have the implant in their foot. But as far as how to proceed with this, with the secondary pathology. Now, some surgeons would we'll take a more conservative approach and only put in a hypercure without even addressing the accessory navicular. Now, most a lot of people have that accessory navicular and don't have any pain. Um, and maybe the pain will happen eventually, but the pain happens because of the tissue reaction from the partial dislocation of the talus on the hind foot. So it's kind of between you and your patient, and it's a little bit of a gamble where you can tell your patient, well, choice one is that we put in the hypercure stent, and that's gonna decrease the strain on, on the soft tissue in the medial column of your foot. So I anticipate that that pain will go away. Usually that should go away within the first couple of weeks even, but we have tissue damage that's so gonna take a year or more for that to completely repair. Or we can go in, and what happened to this patient here where the surgeon performed a kidney procedure um, and did both at the same time, which is great. So um, that's between you and your patient and you have to see what makes the most sense for you. Here's another patient that this was really a severe before and this is risky and it's not a great, um, maybe even the patient needed a larger size. We don't have a great reduction of the before and after, um, but here's the thing. 
is that sometimes some correction is better than no correction. Maybe this patient is a poorly controlled diabetic. Maybe there's other health issues that we can't go in and perform a regular hind foot reconstructive surgery. I'll tell you right now that by putting in this stent, even though we have an under correction, that this is way more corrected than if we would have had the patient still wearing the orthotic, still wearing that AFO or some kind of an ankle brace, because that ankle brace is not gonna be able to give us the same correction. So I call this a success. This patient's life is better because of the insertion of the implant. So we can't always just look at the x-rays and judge was this a good or bad result. This is the same patient. And again, we look at, so I'm looking at the navicular, height here, we can compare the plantar aspect of the navicular to the plantar aspect of the cuboid, and we've lifted up the navicular. We've decreased the strain to the uh, posterior tibial tendon. We've decreased the cyma. We've repositioned the talus on the calcaneus. So this is probably helping not only the patient's foot, but the patient's knees, hips, and back. And especially if they are um, medically compromised, one of the biggest goals that, that doctors always tell their patients is to get out and exercise, go walk. And with this broken foot that they have on the left, it's gonna be nearly impossible. They're gonna suffer so bad. But now that we've given them even just this little bit of correction that can take the strain off, and maybe they're gonna be more active. So get another situation where it was a less than ideal candidate, but we were still able to give them some correction which was better than no correction. This patient probably should have had some mid-tarsal um, work done and the calcaneal osteotomy as well. So was it a stage procedure? I mean, I, again, is this a malpractice lawsuit because they didn't address the other things? I don't think so because they still have a, addressed the, the, the primary deforming force. And um, just as long as the consent was given to the patient and that you know potentially more work needs to be done. But if you only put in the hypercure and never even talked about these other co-deformities, then you haven't done your patient any justice. So anyway, so here, here's a before and after of, this is pretty mild case. Um, this is like the, just a, a, a slam dunk where patients um, are, are just like, they have great success afterward. And uh, usually when you have a sagittal plane deformity like this, you can almost guarantee that the patient has lower back pain because it's going to cause an anterior pelvic tilt and that puts strain on the vertebral column. The back muscles want to tighten up to try to straighten out the spine. And that causes a muscle spasm. And when you're walking through the gait cycle, transitioning from one foot to the other foot, then that's going to put a bend on the vertebral column, which then stresses the ligaments so that forms spinal stenosis, and then that can pinch the nerves. So that's why performing this very minimally invasive procedure has so many positive aspects to the lower extremity, but then also to the knees, hips, and back. So just showing some more transverse plane. And again, I just, I love it when docs send me these pictures. This is a patient one week post-op and just loving life. This patient's so happy. Their feet are realigned and um, life is great. So, and look at the back. So it, it drives me crazy when I go to these conferences and we have a calcaneal valgus here. So what's the recommendation? And so you ask all of these, the, the attendees and well, we're gonna go in and do a medial displacement calcaneal osteotomy, put a couple of screws in. We're gonna do some me medial column work. Um, all this patient had was a hypercure put in. The, Calcaneal valgus happens as a compensation for the medial deviation of the talus on the calcaneus. It's not the other way around. It's not that the calcaneus went into the valgus and then the talus went inward. I mean, it's coupling. There's a coupling effect there, but the calcaneal valgus went away once we stabilized the talus on the calcaneus. And I know this isn't a great forefoot picture, but you also see that there's a normalization, the reduction of the too many toes sign once we straighten out the hind foot. So with the hypercure stent, we are able to get our sagittal and transverse plane correction. Please use the grading system when you um, are thinking about using a hypercure for a patient. Um, some of the other factors that go into deciding if a patient's a candidate or not is patient's weight. For some of the devices on the market, that is absolutely a criteria. When it comes to hypercure, it's not. We have not seen any correlation between patients who have a BMI of greater than whatever you, number you wanna pick and have a higher level of implant removals, doesn't happen. 
um, pre-activity level. So you have that, that um, basketball player that's coming in that has chronic heel pain. You don't want to just cut their plantar fascia and they have knee pain also. So we anticipate that they should be able to return to their sport after they fully recovered um, from the EOTTS procedure. It's always a risk, you never know. Maybe they're gonna have a longer than normal recovery. Maybe they're gonna um, have to complete failure and the implant's gonna be taken out, but that's a risk that the patient's gonna have to take. They're gonna have to weigh the benefit and risk analysis. So there's no such thing as a complication-free procedure, even that as ingrown toenails have resulted in a toe amputation. Um, sometimes the best candidates end up with a less than desired outcome. I've had patients that had absolutely amazing correction in their feet, um, but they just had psychological issues of having a stent in their body and they had to have it taken out or that they just had a low pain threshold and six to eight months, they're just limping around having so much pain. So we had to take the implant out. It's very rare, but it can happen. And then you have other patients that is a less than desired candidate that you're like, man, I hope none of my colleagues ever see that I put this implant into their foot. But then the patients come walking in, they're happy, they're, you've given them their life back, they're able to do all kinds of things that they couldn't do before you corrected their feet with Hypercure. So at the end of the day, some correction is always better than an overcorrection, and an undercorrection is better than no correction. So keep that in mind. And Again, one of the reasons why we talk about the patient selection is simply for this, is because as a surgeon, I want you to look good. I don't want you to fail. And for our patients, we want them to know that, you know, is this gonna work for them or is this gonna be a complete failure? We don't do surgery on patients just to do surgery. We have one goal and that's to try to reduce disease. And that's what we're able to do with the Hypercure implant. But we have to know that there are, there are limitations, that we have something that's broken and we're trying to do our best to make it better, but we can't always bring it back to perfect. So thank you very much. That's our presentation. Um, I hope that I answered your questions. Our email is info at grammedica.com. So please um, email us any other questions, what else we can do for you. We're here for you, we're here for your success. Um, so anyway, so definitely participate with that.